Assalamu alaikum and adab everyone. Today we are back with another session from Life's Medi School, and this is our another lecture. Today we are back with a uh, Professor Dr. Sharma Vyasan Rachakonda, all the way from India, as our mentor. We are Medi School. We have uh, started our work since 2016. The aim of Medi School is to develop skilled medical personnel with proper knowledge and attitude through guided and efficient training. We arrange a series of lectures, online sessions, workshops on significant medical topics. And we've been working since 2016 with the aim to develop skilled doctors and young doctors are loving it. Today we have Dr. Professor Dr. Sharma Vyasan Rachakunda. He's an MBBS, MD in internal medicine, MSc from Canada, FCGP, FICP, FIAMS, FIMSA, FCCP from USA, FACP from USA, FRCP from Germany, FRCP from Edinburgh, Emeritus Professor of Cardiology, Rajiv Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Andhra Pradesh. Consultant Physician, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Adjunct Professor, Tabindaru Dr. MGR Medical University, University Chennai. Online Faculty for MRCP Training, Texila American University. Honorary National Professor of Medicine, IMA CGP. Former Secretary, American College of Physicians, India Chapter. Today, we will learn from Sir about gold guidelines on COPD. Sir, if I have your permission, um, I will request you to uh, start our today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words and a beautiful introduction. Uh, I am not new to you now. I have been doing this for quite a few times. Yes, and today we are meeting again. Uh, for discussing on COPD. What is COPD? Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease in sometimes is also referred to as COAD. Chronic Obstructive Airway Disease. It is both an airway disease as well as a pulmonary disease. So the term COPD is more uh, apt for that. Okay, we are going to discuss the gold guidelines. Before that, the American Lung Association gives a punchline here. When you can't breathe, nothing else matters, isn't it? When we can't breathe, however qualified we are, rich we are, young we are, uh, position we have, nothing matters. Okay. So you have to make our patients breathe happily. That is the part of the story. COPD gold guidelines. What is gold? Global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease. Chronic obstructive lung disease is COLD. Glo global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease is GOLD. Okay, we had the GINA guidelines for asthma. Now we are looking at the global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease. Time now for us to unlearn our age-old outdated practices and embark on modern treatment. Let us see. So the resources that have been utilized in formulating this particular presentation are listed here. Gina, Gold, COPD Professional, Respiratory Guidelines of Canada, American College of Chest Physicians, for which I am a fellow, American Thoracic Society, British Thoracic Society, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NIC, ChestNet, CDC Atlanta, ENA, EPP. This is NHLIB from USC. So I sincerely acknowledge 
whatever we are going to present here there is no commercial interest involved in this it is only for the educative purpose we will be using some of the illustrations and material from them and my sincere acknowledgement uh, to all those resources which have been consulted epitomized and then presented here okay definition of copd number 1 it is chronic number 2 it is progressive number 3 it is treatable and preventable that part all of us should understand it is chronic it is progressive it is treatable very early in the disease and to some extent preventable definitely mostly it's fixed airway obstruction non reversible by bronchodilators the etiology is exposure to noxious agents the commonest noxious insult to the respiratory tree is smoking of course vehicular pollution industry pollution domestic kitchen pollution and then um, pollution due to occupation all are important but the single most important factor is smoking there are two entities one chronic bronchitis the second emphysema in this particular thing there are two diseases are involved one is chronic bronchitis the other is emphysema the important thing is we as you see on the left side we see how we go about in this presentation the first one is i am defining the disease remember it is a chronic progressive airway obstruction treatable and preventable non reversible by conventional bronchodilators there is an exposure to noxious agent and that noxious agent mostly smoking there are two entities chronic bronchitis and emphysema okay what are these two entities let us look at chronic bronchitis on the right side there is productive cough a period of at least 3 months or more means what if somebody says <coughs> cough one two days it is not chronic bronchitis the symptoms must be at least for a period of 3 months and in each of the two consecutive years then only it is chronic bronchitis okay absence of any other identifiable cause for excessive sputum production like tuberculosis bronchiectasis lung abscess viral infections all those to be excluded air flow limitation that is not fully reversible partially it could be reversible and it is not fully reversible abnormal inflammatory response to the noxious agent mostly smoking so what did we learn a productive cough of over 3 months in two consecutive years there is no other identifiable reason for the productive cough there is a flow limitation which is partly reversible and there is an inflammatory response to the noxious agent like smoking okay what is emphysema emphysema is alveolar wall destruction a reversible enlargement of the air spaces the alveoli and distal to the terminal bronchioles the disease here is distal to the terminal bronchiole in chronic bronchitis it is in the lower bronchi and the bronchioles here there is no evidence of fibrosis in emphysema in fact the lung is over expanded and not shrunken by fibers okay there is alveolar alveolar wall destruction and air spaces become bigger the coil is and form big you know, some balloon like things and the disease is distal to the terminal bronchiole and there is no evidence of fibrosis okay look here asthma at the bottom and copd at the top are the two diseases or one disease in fact there is lot of overlap between asthma emphysema and chronic bronchitis as you see here asthma can be overlapping with emphysema and chronic bronchitis which together also overlap 
So in some patients, there will be chronic bronchitis and also emphysema, and that will be the segment of the patient. Okay, in the others, rest of 80%, exclusive emphysema, exclusive chronic bronchitis. There's a small proportion who are asthmatics also, who go into uh, airflow obstruction, which is rather irreversible. In the full reversibility, it is asthma. In the non-reversibility, it is COP. Reversibility of the airway obstruction is the criterion to say that it is progressing towards COP. Okay. If you treat, again, the airflow obstruction can come down and patient will become better. Okay. Now, asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis can overlap one another, mostly emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In around 20% of the patients, they will overlap. Only 5% of the patients, they may have asthma going on to emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Okay, now. So what are the risk factors for COPD? The, the host factors and the exposure. So you have, you have the genetic predisposition, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This alpha-1 antitrypsin is, uh, this gene produces a molecule, which is called surfactant, which keeps the airways pliable, and then they will be uh, collapsing and expanding during respiration. In the absence of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, this electricity of the lung is lost. There is a hyper responsiveness to the noxious agent. There will be lung growth factors, low body weight, low birth weight, and then age are also important factors. As age advances, one important risk factor for uh, COPD is age. Exposure, tobacco smoking, biomass fuel in some homes in Southeast Asia, in India, Bangladesh, we use the cow dung and other biomass fuels and use open fires. And they are not properly combusted completely. The combustion is incomplete and that generates noxious particles due to open fires. Occupational dust exposure, pneumoconiosis, chemical factories, infections, overcrowding, damp weather, low socioeconomic status, low dietary vegetable and fruit intake. Remember, this is one thing which we have to tell the patients because the antioxidants are very important to uh, prevent as well as reduce the impact of the exposure. Another important concept that all of us should understand is the pack years. What are pack years? You just don't ask whether the patient smokes or not, that's no use. You have to ask how many cigarettes per day and how long has he been smoking. Each packet, I guess roughly, is around 20 cigarettes. If somebody smokes 10 cigarettes, you call it as 0.5 packets. 20 cigarettes is one packet multiplied by the number of years. Let us say if one person smokes two packets per day and he is smoking for eight years, then Pack years will be two packets per day into eight years is the duration that gives the number of pack years because there is dose response. That means the more the smoking, the more is the damage. This slide tells that there is host factors, genetics, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, hyper responsiveness, low birth weight, and then age are important factors. And then here, tobacco smoke, biomass fuels, occupational infections, socioeconomic status, and low dietary vegetables and fruits. Number of pack years is important. The most important risk factor is, of course, smoking. Now, today, women smokers, pregnant women smokers, before the children, young child of less than a year, and they keep smoking. This was the Western habit, but today in our countries too, this is happening. You see, childhood smoking, children, 15 years, 12 year boys, school going boys, they keep smoking. 
and there is also passive smoking that is if one member of the family one member of the group of friends is a smoker it, it the exhaled air from that person contains those particles and that is smoking childhood smoking and then woman smoking passive smoking are important factors teenagers tender age groups you see how boys now today girls are no exceptions college students they think that it is a sign of civilization in fact it is a negative civilization intense cause for concern and all of us have to work what i urge all of you is convert one smoker in your lifetime into non smoker not many one smoker in your lifetime as a doctor make him non smoker the problem of smoking is solved because luckily the percentage of smokers is hardly 20 to 25% of the entire population so if 75% of the people are non smokers so motivate one on one you can win the battle okay now the effect of smoking you see here never smoke that is the beauty of the lung function fev1 we will see what it is is uh, the value of fev1 at the age of 25 and a percentage of that never smoked even at the age of 75 it remains 75% of my fev1 at my age of 25 that means i am 75% fit like a ma young man of 25 if i don't smoke if i smoke if somebody smoke then 25% only is remaining and in a matter of few years the death if he stops smoking at 65 still there is another again of 8 to 10 years if you start smoking somewhere around 45 then you see the gain in life is somewhere around 20 25 years what does this mean this means It's a beautiful way of preventing. The earlier to bring them, make make them non-smokers, the better. The best thing is be a non-smoker throughout life. The second best thing is quit smoking. The earliest indication that you are asked to do by your doctor. You have to emphasize on that. Otherwise, you see the disability is worse. If my lungs are functioning. Only 25 percent of what they should, then you can imagine how bad the quality of life will be. So how does this happen? The noxious particles we know different types. Smoking is the first one. There are host factors like your alpha one antitrypsin, growth factors, and other things, and age, and they act on the noxious particles and gases and produce lung inflammation. This lung inflammation. will be tackled by antioxidants foods like vegetables and fruits and that if it is not properly done the antioxidant stress occurs the antioxidants are not there oxidative stress and here there are anti proteinases are produced in the body these anti proteinases interfere with the lung inflammation when they are absent then that results in excess proteinases these proteinases they have are are they, they interfere with the repair mechanism and finally copd will happen so what happens now there are host factors and these host factors will lead to inflammation that inflammation is normally checked by the anti proteinases that goes unchecked in the presence of proteinases and that goes into oxidative stress the absence of antioxidant that leads to copd pathology okay now inflammation what is the problem there that is hypersensitivity in asthma here it is inflammation small airway disease small airway inflammation airway remodeling parenchymal destruction loss of alveolar wall attachment decrease in the elastic recoil and air flow limitation obstructive airway disease 
the inflammation works in two ways in chronic bronchitis mostly the small airways are involved airway limitation occurs airway inflammation airway remodeling airway limitation there is parenchymal destruction leads to emphysema alveolar wall attachments are destroyed and decrease in the elastic requirement of the lung and lungs are permanently expanded and the alveolar spaces become bigger suppose normally these are the alveolar spaces normal alveolar spaces the walls in between them are destroyed the whole thing becomes like a bag because the central walls are destroyed this is emphysema okay now how do i contrast the two important obstructive airway diseases asthma and copd here there is a sensitizing agent here there is a noxious agent sensitizing agent may be pollen may be house dust may be any other sensitizing mold spores everything so there is an airway inflammation cd4 and t lymphocytes are created eosinophil is the predominant cell and then completely reversible at least in the first 10 years okay one in copd airway inflammation is there cd8 are recruited and then macrophages and neutrophils are the participating cells there is complete irreversibility so here is nephilia hypersensitivity noxious agent macrophages and neutrophils are the important things we have discussed quite a bit of the pathogenesis and now we will go about looking at the clinical features and other aspects now one more slide on pulmonary hypertension the problem with copd is it will lead to pulmonary hypertension just like systemic hypertension there will be pulmonary hypertension this pulmonary hypertension copd leads to this the normal pulmonary artery which is the, this is the intima media and the, and then the outer core okay so the here there is intimal proliferation and medial thickening you see how much thickening of the media occurs and there is also a lot of globular cells and then sputum production in the inner layers duplication of the elastic lamina that is the elastic lamina this is the elastic lamina and then you also have medial hypertrophy which leads to thicker pulmonary arteries which are not compliant and that results in increased a pressure in the pulmonary artery which is called pulmonary hypertension okay now emphysematous bulle can be formed there will be narrowing of the heart shadow and there will be chronic bronchitis picture and the horizontal ribs ribs are normally like you know they are like that but here they become horizontal because the lung is rather uh, elongated increased number of rib, ribs visible cardiomegaly in the initial in the late stages initially there will be narrowing of the heart diaphragm dome of domes of diaphragm are flattened and these are some of the uh, features x ray features of COPD alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency specific circumstances uh, alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency the emphysema and endodial no obvious factors like smoking somebody develops COPD in a very young age and is a non smoker you consider them as uh, alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency necrotizing paniculitis systemic vasculitis there will be anca anti neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody cirrhosis of liver hepatocellular carcinoma undetermined etiology of bronchiectasis other unexplained liver diseases family history of one of these conditions and especially sickly siblings of pljz individual genetic mutation only 2% of the copd is of an antic but remember young individual with no other noxious factors coming with copd consider of an antic infections okay now if one quit smoking treatment starts with reducing the risk the pack concept 
studies have shown the rate of decline in the lung function slows and there will be definite clinical and pulmonary function improvement i have already explained what is what is back here okay this man as though there is no tomorrow he is smoking and smoking a chain smoker so there are two types of presentations pink puffers and blue blotters pink puffers are people with uh, without heart failure associated they are very thin and they will be pink in color and puffing like that the blue blotters the body is waterlogged edema ascites and then uh, pedal edema uh, will be there and they are the ones who have car pulmonary sorry c o r car pulmonary car pulmonary is heart failure secondary to lung failure okay there is an mrc dyspnea scale grade 0 no breathlessness except on strenuous exercise grade 1 shortness of breath when walking uphill or while carrying to hurrying to catch a bus or train to walk slower than the contemporaries has to stop for breath while walking alone number 3 Uh, grade three stops for breath while walking hundred meters or up to two or three minutes. Number four, grade four, two breaths to leave the house or while dressing. Even this is important because once you trade, you expect grade four to reverse back to grade three and grade two. So remember the dyspnea MRC dyspnea scale. Then how do I differentiate COPD and asthma? smoking almost everyone here may not be there less than 35 copd is rare nearly asthma is a young disease sputum highly productive very mucoid dyspnea very persistent and episodic course progressive variable here in asthma spirometry obstructive no reversibility here obstructive and reversible reversibility less than 15% reversibility more than 15% treatment long long acting bronch bronch beta beta agonists and then muscarinic agonists and ics are the later stages here ics are the first one short acting beta agonists and long acting beta agonists we'll come to that leukotrienes not useful here very useful in us now assessment of copd the first question is is the patient what is the age of the patient is it 35 years plus yes we should consider copd symptoms cough sputum dyspnea more than one month at least for two months they must be persisting and or an occupational exposure indoor outdoor exposure air pollution most importantly smoking so the person who has got symptoms of chronic cough sputum dyspnea who is 35 years and above who has history of exposure these people must go for spirometry then we diagnose the diagnostic uh, evaluation is not x ray not ct scan not pet scan but a spirometry test what is the office spirometry is done by peak flow meter peak flow meter hey, all of you should possess it it costs around 600 700 rupees indian rupees and it is the easiest way to pick up in the general practitioner's office at the early air flow obstruction so by that so just like you have a stethoscope you have a peak flow meter with you okay now small handheld spirometer sir have today this i have with me uh, this is the siplamed and there are other models also are available these are as good as the big machines in the hospitals they give all the values that you can see and the brand name here is vitalograph vitalograph is a sipla product and it is a handheld spirometer so what is the curve like this is a flow versus volume this volume here on the x axis is the volume and the flow rate per second liters per second is on the y axis the patient starts exhaling 
and you produce a curve like that. And after full exhalation, expiration, it deeply inspires. This is the inspiratory part. Okay. This is the expiratory part of the curve. So you should urge the patient to continue for six seconds to exhale. He takes a deep breath and blows as fast and as hard as he, he or she can and continues to blow it until six seconds. Then sucks back. As though whatever he has left out, you should bring it back into the lung. So the expiratory loop on the positive side and the inspiratory loop on the negative side. So this is a pyrogram or normal flow volume curve. Okay. This is the forced vital capacity. This is the total lung capacity, residual volume pathway. Now you see, obstructive picture will be like this. This is the normal curve. In an obstruction, there will be concavity like that. Obstructive. Severe obstruction, you see very much. The height is very less and concave. Here height is good, but concavity is there. Repeat. Here height also is reduced and concave. Restrictive lung disease, they can't have it like that. So it is restricted. So an obstructive, severe obstructive and restrictive. By looking at the curve itself, you can say whether it is obstructive lung disease, severe obstruction or restrictive lung disease. Okay, what are the measures we take? Force vital capacity, force expiratory volume in the first second. Normally, when we expire, we should be able to put out at least 75% of the air in the lungs in the first second because the airways are very open. In people with airway obstruction, they will not be able to put out that much of air. It will be 50%, 60%, or something like that. Then you calculate a ratio of FEV1 by FVC and peak expiratory flow rate and force expiratory time. Force expiratory time is prolonged in case of COP. Normally, we will be able to complete our respiration in two to three seconds. These people will do more than six seconds. Okay, prolonged FET, forced expiratory time, and then the FEV1 and FEV1 by FVC. The two important measures, FVC and FEV1, and take a ratio of that. Okay. There are no fixed normal values, just like blood pressure, you don't say 20 by 80 or pulse rate 80 per minute like that. It depends on the age, sex, and the height, weight, and ethnicity. When you record pulmonary function, you require to know the age, gender, height, and weight, and ethnicity. Based on that, there will be nomograms. FVC is, if it is more than 80% of the predicted value, for that age and gender, height and weight, it is normal. FEV1, more than 80% normal. The ratio, 75%. That means, out of the total vital capacity, at least 75% should be put out in first second. If that is not done, there is no problem. PEFR, normally, if it is more than 80% so predicted, it is normal. FET, as I told you, normal individuals less than four seconds. It is prolonged to six to eight seconds in case of uh, people with COP. So what am I looking at? There are no normal values. Depends on the age, gender, height, weight, and ethnicity. Forced vital capacity more than ninety percent is predicted. Perfect. FEV one. More than 80 percent predicted normal. If you have the ratio of FEV1 by FVC is less than 75 percent. Clinically, what does that mean? Patient is not able to put out the entire breath, most of it in the first second. He has to take many seconds to produce the air out. That is the restriction of the ratio of FEV1 by FVC. Peak expiratory flow rate and FET are also important measures. So, this is the normal subject, FEV1, more than 80%. In people with asthma, 60%. In people with chronic bronchitis, 
F V one by F V C uh, ratio and F V one are reduced to forty percent. Here in asthma, we give bronchodilator reversible. This not reversible. That is the difference. Okay. Certain abbreviations in health corticosteroids, I C S, I B D in health bronchodilator, short acting beta two agonist SABA, long acting beta two agonist LABA. Long acting anti muscarinic lama, muscarinic agent and beta agonist, MABA, leukotrienes, we don't use in COPD, oral corticosteroids, sustained release preparations. So, this is important because most of the time we say ICS plus IBD, SABA, LAVA, like that. You must understand what they are. Now, as I told you last time, the bronchomotor tone is like driving a car. In order to accelerate the car, you must release the pedal on the brake. The brake pedal should be released, and the acceleration pedal should be pressed. Then only the car will move. So, if the bronchi have to dilate, they must not constrict. So, the constriction must be prevented. Constriction is like the brake. Let us say you don't constrict it, then they become loose, and then they are ready to dilate. And the next one is acceleration that is dilated. So the sympathetic, sympathomimetic agents, that is the beta two agonists, they are bronchodilators. The muscarinic agents, anti-muscarinic agents, are preventing the bronchoconstriction, preventing the bronchoconstriction, facilitating the dilatation. There are two mechanisms. One is to dilate the bronchi. The other is to prevent constriction. What prevents constriction? The muscarinic agents, anti-muscarinic agents. The patropium, tiatropium, lama, sa, this. Whereas here, bronchodilators are short-acting beta agonists, long-acting beta agonists, and like that. So use a combination of both in case of COPD. Generally, in asthma, we don't use the musk anti-muscarinic agents. So this is the parasympathetic drive that is at the preganglionic level. Then, of course, there is a uh, there is a acetylcholine at the postganglionic damp terminal. Again, in parasympathetic, there will be acetylcholine. In sympathetic, this 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 will be adrenaline and noradrenaline, and this acts on the muscarinic receptors on the airway smooth muscle. So parasympathetic constricts the airways, and you block the parasympathetic by doing giving anti-muscarinic agent. So much so, the constriction is prevented. Whereas the bronchodilators, which we use short acting beta agonists like salbutamol, terbutaline, these are sympathomimetic agents, beta agonists that dilate the bronchi. The combined mechanism is used to treat. So the anticholinergics or antiparasympathetic agents are cholinergic drive is the main bronchoconstrictor pathway. Anticholinergics by reducing the bronchomotor tone and they prevent constriction. There are three types of receptors, muscarinic 1, 2, and 3, epitropium and oxytropium, teatropium are slow in their answer. Bronchodilatation up to eight hours can be there. They have influence on the sleep quality in COPD, epitropium, optimal doses, 8 mic 80 micrograms. Teatropium is long, long acting. Selective for M1, M3 is much better, and once a day dosing of 40 micrograms is important. Two important drugs are available: apatropium, 12 hours, 8 hours to 12 hours, 80 micrograms is the dose. Relatively short, I mean not long yet. Whereas the long acting one is the teatropium. We use uh, 40 micrograms once a day. Eatropium once a day, 40 micrograms. Epatropium twice a day, 80 micrograms. Okay. IBD inhaled bronchodilators, ICS inhaled corticosteroids, and then beta beta two receptors, anti muscarinic agents, and inhaled corticosteroids. These will come into picture in COPD only later in the disease. Short acting steroids, long acting inhaled steroids. Short acting anti muscarinic, epitropium, oxytropium. Long acting, teatropium. Short acting 
beta agonist salbutamol levosalbutamol ergotaline phenetrol long acting beta agonist formiterol erfometrol salmeterol indesiterol bamboterol these are 12 hours to 24 hours action these are 6 hours to 8 hours action this is 12 hours this is 24 hours okay they are short acting and long acting various combinations of beta receptor agonists anti muscarinic agents and inhaled corticosteroids are available and now a combination of them combination inhalers also are available always when the disease is acute you use short acting when the disease is chronic you use long acting when there is acute exacerbation use the short acting when the patient is stable use the long acting these are late in the use of steroids is late in copd but they are the first agents in asthma okay now bronchodilators onset of action are given salbutamol very quick 6 hours salmeterol 12 hours anticholinergic epitropium 48 hours teatropium 24 hours and the most important m1 and m3 are more modulated it is a better drug compared to epitropium okay now how do i stage the disease stage 1 mild that is the ratio i we told that it is anything more than 75 is normal so if it is less than 70 it is mild less than 60 it is moderate and less than 40 it is severe and less than 30 is very severe okay so seven less than 70 mild what is the 70 a fev1 by a fvc ratio always look at the fev1 by a fvc ratio less than 70 mild less than 60 moderate less than 40 severe and less than 30 very severe why is it required the severity of the disease it can be reversed with treatment and if we quantify the severity we know whether the patient is progressing or not okay what are the systemic side effects this is an off task question copd what are the systemic effects of copd muscle weakness cellular changes increased inflammatory markers impaired water and sodium excretion peripheral edema cord pulmonary renal impairment also increased metabolic rate cachexia particularly people with chronic bronchitis the pink puffers, they are very thin people, bone resorption and osteoporosis also. So, what are the non-pulmonary manifestations of COPD? Maybe a short one. One, muscle weakness. Two, in, in, inflammatory markers like CRP, ferritin, LDH are increased. Impaired renal sodium and water excretion, peripheral edema, cachexia, increased metabolic rate, bone resorption, and osteoporosis are systemic effects of COPD. So you have to now understand the board index. What is board index? Board index B is BMI, O is the, oximate, the pulmonary oxygen, that is the delivery of the uh, air out, O is the pulmonary function, D E is the dyspnea grade and E is the six minute walking distance. Very easy. BMI you can easily calculate depending on the weight and the height. Weight by height square uh, per be, will be the BMI and then O FEV1. We, we measure the FEV1 and then grade it more than 65, 0 points, 50 to 64, 1 point. And 36 to 50, two points. Less than 36, three points. BMI more than 21, zero points. If he is cachectic, that gives one point. MRC grading we have already seen: zero one, grade two, grade three, grade four. This gives three points. So like that, six minute distance in meters. If you ask the patient to walk at his comfortable pace in six minutes. If he can cover at least 350 meters, it is zero. 350 is one. 150 to 250 is two. And less than 150 meters 
in six minutes, that is per minute 30 meters, are roughly 90 feet. It's not able to cover, that is three. So give the number, the board score is zero to two, mortality is 10%, board score is seven to 10, mortality is 80% in a matter of four years. The fellow with the board score of 70, 7 to 10 will not be available for you after four years because the mortality is as high as 80% in those people. Very easy scoring. BMI, a fever, a fever one, MRC grade, and six minute distance. Six minute distance, main, very few physicians really do the six minute distance. You have to do that. And MRC grading also, I told you, you have to do the MRC grading, do the spirometry, look at the FEV1 and take the BMI and you obtain the board score. If the board score is anywhere between 0 to 2, mild disease, mortality 10%. If it is between 2 and 7, 2 and 6, it is moderate disease. More than 7, it is severe disease, mortality very high. So again, the same thing, mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. Here the FEV1 is used, and also the FEV1 comes down as you go here. And add regular here, treatment also we are discussing here. Active reduction in the risk factors, influenza vaccination should be done for all the grades. Short-acting bronchodilators as and when needed on a SOS basis. Bronchodilators, and as well spaces add here you have long acting bronchodilators and also glucocorticoids ltot long term oxygen therapy for this grade so you have the uh, musk anti muscarinic saba and labas here we have added steroids here we have added sorry we have added the long long acting drugs here we added the steroids here we added the home oxygen, depending on the severity. So management of uh, COPD, bronchodilator medications are central in asthma, inhaled corticosteroids are central. That is the preventers are important there. Here if bronchodilatation is important. The two mechanisms can be put to use. One is the beta agonist, the other is the anti -muscarinic. Combine them, a combination of them. And as and when need basis, you can use, and if the symptoms are persisting on a regular basis. The principal bronchodilator treatments are beta to agonist, anticholinergics, or a combination. The role of theophilin is questionable in COPD. None of the existing medications for COPD has shown to modify the long term decline in the lung function. What is that? These drugs are not disease modifying. Unlike in asthma, where in corticosteroids are disease-modifying agents. Therefore, the pharmacotherapy of COPD is to decrease the symptoms and complications and nothing to do with the disease process. But then how do you bring the disease process to a halt or reverse it? Stop the inciting agent, the smoking. So the use of medication, bronchodilator medication, either the beta agonist or the anti or a combination is only to give a better quality of life and reduce the symptoms. And whenever there is infection, you treat with antibiotic, the COVID, the bronchitis part. But these will not modify the disease. What modifies the disease? Stopping smoking is the only important Thing which can halt the disease, right? Now, management of COPD, no systemic steroids for COPD. Inhalation is the best. Salmetrol, first choice. Epatropium, second choice. Combination can be used. Salmetrol may be used in birth. Inhaled steroids come third. Combination inhalers. Oral beta 2 is the fourth level. Theophyllin, long acting preparations are available. Acibrophilin and others. Maybe very late in the disease, not injectable theophyllin. There is no role for Montelukast, which is anti which are very useful in asthma. 
there is no role for asthma oxygen therapy in asthma very rarely whereas there is a role for oxygen therapy here now no systemic steroids for copd inhalation is the best first is beta agonist s a b a short acting beta agonist then you have short acting uh, s a n a anti muscarinic they are a combination inhaled steroids third combinations can be used oral steroid beta to fourth theophylline questionable role no montelukast oxygen yes so this is how we different drugs combinations we use for the treatment of copd okay now theophylline i am skipping because it is not a very widely used drug the safety window is very low and no question of injection it is banned in many countries inhaled glucocorticoids stage 1 and stage 2 no role only in stage 3 you use inhaled corticosteroids and stage 3 to stage 4 copd we can use inhaled corticosteroids so what else they can give pneumococcal vaccine must be offered to every copd patient initiation of early oxygen this is one thing which is where physicians don't in insist they wait till the patient becomes really sick and start thinking of oxygen you give or give them there are now today the home oxygenator are available early oxygen therapy will increase the survival and increase the quality good quality of life prolonged use of inhaled steroids uh, uh, is not good when you want to use long acting maybe better alpha 1 antitrypsin is available if it is deficient you can supplement prolastin aralast is available commercially alpha 1 antitrypsin but not in everyone in those where the alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is the cause of copd antibiotic not for chronic prescription but for short term burst for exacerbations then n acetyl cysteine also can be used as a mucolytic to bring out the spot immunomodulators are under trial calcium and vitamin d supplementation is essential because we do have the problem of bone resorption and osteoporosis apart from the direct treatment of the respiratory tree this slide is very vital pneumococcal vaccine is not given to all the copd patients i have seen the lack of prescribing pneumococcal vaccine so remember pneumococcal vaccine for all copd irrespective of the age for all the people above 65 okay early oxygen therapy and then uh, steroids if you want to use maximum 2 weeks and then bring down oral steroids inhaled steroids can be given alpha 1 antitrypsin in those that are deficient antibiotics in short bursts n acetyl cysteine as a mucolytic immunomodulators are being tried and supplement calcium and vitamin now what now don't prescribe cough syrups because it is not the question of trying to you know suppress the cough here here don't give antitussis don't suppress the cough mucolytics some role is there no prophylactic antibiotic no long term antibiotic no systemic steroid no narcotics no antihistamine that dry the airway breathing exercises are not going to really help because already there is over expansion of the alveoli and they may damage So normal breathing they can do, not very heavy breathing exercises. No withholding of benefits of cough. This is crucial. The crucial is do not withhold the oxygen until late stage. Do not suppress the cough. No prophylactic antibiotic. No systemic steroid. No long term antibiotic. Not heavy breathing exercises. Don't withhold the oxygen therapy. future development emphasis on early diagnosis anti smoking devices copd primary care issue by the general physician and the newer drugs are available tiotropium takes a center stage and then pde4 inhibitors are available now the was for bronchodilatation the sildenafil group of drugs and drugs to decrease neutrophilic inflammation are also available mediator agonists of inflammation are also available oxygen therapy new drug deliveries 
decreasing the industrial pollution, quitting the smoking, diagnostic facility with PEFR, and then the spirometry, and then COPD in future might increase, mortality might increase. Now we have to tackle those things. The take home messages, asthma and COPD are not specialist problems. Asthma and COPD are not specialist problems. They are the problems of the general cases. COPD is alarmingly increasing and remember it is preventable. And then please differentiate asthma from COPD because here ICS inhaled corticosteroids is the main treatment. Here IBD and then uh, short acting anti muscarinic agents are the treatment for COPD. Okay. And then spirometry liberally you should use peak flow meter and spirometry just like ECG. Everybody who have who is symptomatic, who is above 35, who is a smoker, must get a spirometry done. Not many doctors use spirometry at all. They just do not bother to quantify the amount of obstruction early. Then do not embark on derivative and betanosol or some untested combinations for breathlessness. Do not use theophylline as far as possible. Inhalation therapy is the best way of treatment. Do not spare COPD again and again from early oxygen therapy. I am emphasizing finally motivates smokers to quit. One doctor motivates to one patient to quit smoking in lifetime. It is quite happy situation. Passive smoking also is prevented. Now, CO, the question is, keep this questioner ready. Could it be COPD? A patient has come with respiratory symptoms, cough, breathlessness, productive sport. Could it be COPD? How do I know that? Do you cough several times most of the days? Question is, yes, sir. If yes, maybe COPD. Do you bring a phlegm or mucus most of the day? Yes. Do you get out of breath more easily than people of your age? Answer is yes. Are you older than 40 years? Are you a current or an ex smoker? If these questions are answered, you can pick up COPD very early. If you answered yes to three or more of these questions, there is a chance that you will have seen. Then immediately ask for spirometry. Take time to think about your lung. Learn about COPD. Okay. Do you cough most of the days? Do you bring up sputum? Do you become breathless compared to other people of your age? Are you older than 40 years? Are you a present or excess smoker? If they answer three out of the five, is positive, sure, you should investigate for COPD. If you don't do that, the Almighty is watching. He will catch you. This is a bad doctor. He hasn't diagnosed COPD early and postponed it till the patient became invalid. A great sin, not excused by any Almighty for that matter. Okay. Now the drug deliveries, you know, metered doses, dry powders, Compressed disc spaces, nebulizers, all of you are familiar. This is how to demonstrate very important. The patient has to first exhale two, three times, then completely breathe out, put it in the mouth. While doing it, to synchronize the MDI and then hold it in the mouth. Sheet set. Okay. Then exhale fully. That is the demonstrate the method. Ask the patient to demonstrate to you back whether they have understood the technique correctly also. So depending on the dexterity and the age of the patient, you can choose the type of inhaler that you use. Okay. So this is a rotahaler, dry powder, MDI meter dose, spaces for young people. Generally, COPD is not a problem with the young. In asthmatics, yes, the spices are useful. And the dry powder is uh, very convenient for most of the people. The synchronization issue 
is not there with the dry powder. Rehabilitation is very important. For the lungs to get more air, what you have to do? Pursed lip breathing. What is pursed lip breathing? Take the, close the lips and then inhale and then exhale through the mouth. Pursed lip breathing, like breathing out slowly into a straw. Not very vigorous breathing exercises. Like that. As though you are blowing into a straw. Not forceful. Gentle breathing. Okay. Now, this is also very important lung exercises. The patient should sit comfortably, relax your shoulders like that. Then put one hand on the abdomen and one hand on the chest. Now inhale slowly through your nose. Push your abdomen out while you breathe in. Then push your abdominal muscles and breathe out. Using pulse. So very important breathing exercises. Not very deep breathing pranayamas and all that. This is the type of exercise which you have to do. So referral is required. The diagnosis is uncertain. Disproportionate symptoms. Persistent symptoms. Develops lung cancer. Requires pulmonary rehabilitation. Nebulizer assessment and oxygen assessment. So this is an oxygenator. Home oxygenators are available. Now one can buy for about 40, 50,000 the home oxygenator. It can deliver up to 5 to 10 liters per minute at home. What does it do? It takes the room air and removes the nitrogen and gives the oxygen. No cylinder problem, no replacement. No maintenance. Only thing is, once in a year or so, you clean the filters. The room air is taken, the machine separates the nitrogen and delivers the oxygen. So, nebulization in case of acute this one, patient patient, explain the disease, inflammation, explain the action of the drugs, long term therapy, you emphasize allay fears, peak flow testing, symptom treatment diary is important. Can be effectively controlled, though cannot be cured. COPD and asthma management programs include education, objective lung measurement, environmental, and pharmacotherapy. Stepwise approach in the pharmacotherapy is also important. So, the most important thing is pledge to stop smoking. We have to see that every year we convert. One smoker in the practice of 30 years would have converted 30 smokers. The greatest uh, sort of merit in the form of punya, whatever you call, in terms of merit you can acquire, and Almighty will give you all plus points if you make others stop smoking. Yours faithfully, myself. Urges a little time spent in talking to our patients. It's really a great investment. This may make all the difference between a happy life and pulmonary invalidity. So we have now completed our 59 slides. And thank you all.